Hi everyone, welcome to the Sums Up channel for professionals in law, compliance and technology. Today's topic for discussion will be self-sovereign identity. Will it revolutionize the market, destroy the current KYC providers and KYC flows, KYC solutions, or everything is going to be the same? Let's start with the basics for a second. What personal identity is about, right? It's not just a name or a date of birth. It's different in types of information about yourself, including your habits, your occupation, your beliefs, preferences, whatever. Uh, all this information is gathered either by the state or by the corporate entities to help you obtain some services, goods, and at the end of the day, they earn money on, based on this on this information. One thing I think would be important to discuss in terms of identity and the person present situation with identity. About 1.1 billion people in the world currently has no legal identity, but at the same time, 3 billion people, they're gonna have electronic ID documents by the end of this year. So you can see how controversial is the situation. Next basic question is whether you own, as a data subject, your identity. Are you a sovereign of your identity, if you will? Let's take a very uh, simple example, the passport. Most of the people think that the passport is their property, but in real life, this is an illusion. In most cases, not in most cases, in all cases, passport is, um, is not a property of the person, it's the property of the government who issued the passport. And so you can find the specific phrase in the US law saying that the US passport is the property of the US government and should be returned upon request. For example, that the Dutch citizens are not allowed to share the specific numbers on their ID cards to anyone except their government, and so they have to mask these numbers from the image of the document. Uh, another type of the um, uh, of the information that are related to that is related to uh, identity is let's say different types of personal information about uh, about let's say habits, um, personal life, and whatever uh, that the person usually shares uh, through social media, online shops, etc., etc. Most of the people think that this information is covered with the privacy regulations, etc., etc. This is to a certain extent so, um, especially in Europe where uh, GDPR is applicable. But in real life, you have no real control over your information once, once, you, um, once you share this information against um, in any data sources. And so you cannot control who shared this information with whom. You can claim, of course, that this information is, should be deleted and not shared with anyone, but you, not, you cannot control the operation of these procedures. You can only hope that this will be working this way. One of the very peculiar cases related to the ownership of uh, personal information um, is definitely the case uh, uh, handled by the um, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit called Vanna White against uh, Samsung Entertainment Company. This case was, uh, it happened in 1994 and uh, Vanna White is a very famous uh, TV host in the US. It's the uh, TV host of the, uh, uh, of the show called uh, The Wheel of Fortune. She is the very um, uh, well-known blonde a beautiful woman with, with a very peculiar appearance. And so um, Samsung used her appearance in their advertisement. Although it was not Vanna White, it was kind of like a robot in a, a very specific dress that would, was associated with the uh, appearance of Vanna White and definitely um, the color of her hair. Vanna White um, uh, sued um, Samsung for basically stealth of personal appearance that was associated with Van White. And actually she won this case. And currently this is probably one of the very rare situations when the court really honored um, what I would call personal appearance as a kind of quasi form of property. But this is not a typical situation. So in general, in general, identity is not something that you can call your ownership.
So it's no surprise that uh, so many people have concerns about the privacy of their identity and personal data. Um, in 2019, the Pew Research Center in the United States have made a census about the public opinion of the US citizens as to the privacy of their personal data and information. And the results are quite astonishing. But 80% uh, have concerns about the lack of control. 80% risks is not outweighed by the benefits. In March 2021, the Swiss voters uh, voted against the law that uh, introduced the electronic identification system in Switzerland. With 64%, uh, they, they were against any kind of form in which uh, the Swiss government basically allowed private companies to administer the national identity system. And one of the polit political scientists uh, in the country uh, also com commented that one of the reasons of this vote was definitely concerns about the privacy. Before we go to the centralized identity, we can uh, sum it up that uh, the centralized identity has certain problems related to the way how the information is stored and how it's um, processed. So one of the uh, biggest fears definitely is that uh, uh, this data subject doesn't understand why this, the information is collected, how the information is used and where it goes. The uh, main beneficiaries of the current, let's say, data verification flows are large corporations, including, for example, credit reference bureaus, such as, for example, Experian and Equifax, and how they store and how they sell the information to, to other corporate uh, entities and corporate giants. And of course, the data leaks. Severe data leaks have become a part of our daily routine. The amounts of profiles that have been leaked were uh, counted like with millions. And just in 2021, according to the cybersecurity magazine, there had been at least 10 large data leaks. Android, StripChat, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the most beautiful one is definitely Cognite. That's the company that is uh, specializing in cybersecurity, and they have had five billion profiles leaked from their uh, cybersecurity database that was actually designed to warn against data leaks. Now, in case of um, self-sovereign or decentralized identity, the user controls all the data by him, him or herself. The person can check what kind of information really he or she wants to share with anyone. And so the problem of sharing, let's say, an image of the passport is not at stake anymore. Now, how it all works. There are three key persons in the process. The one is called the holder, and this is the data subject. Another is, the, is called the issuer, and this is the person who is issuing the, the specific credential. For example, that the person's name is uh, John Smith, or that the person is born at this specific um, date, or the person has specific, let's say, uh, degree from a specific university or anything like that. And then there is a third uh, party, which is the verifier, and this is specifically the um, entity who is interested in this specific verification. For example, the person is getting enrolled in the uh, university, and the university wants to know some specific information that is necessary for this uh, onboarding. And so this information is checked um, uh, from the against the information from the issuer. These three types of um, players in this game are um, members of what is called the Triangle of Trust. In most cases, what is behind the self-sovereign identity is definitely the use of blockchain. Blockchain is very, very useful in order to use, to, uh, to work as a registry for verifiable credentials and uh, distributed um, decentralized uh, identifiers. Uh, although um, we wouldn't say that this is always necessary. And blockchain, of course, is fantastic because this is something that you cannot, um, uh, you cannot um, forge and make uh, any changes in it because all members of the blockchain, all 
uh, elements are uh, on their places and you cannot displace one block with another. Now, the, the problems are also ahead, of course. Um, uh, most of the professionals in this sphere are saying that um, the current infrastructure in the world is not ready for the massive use of self-sovereign identity systems, and the blockchains are not as, as, as uh, ready for that. In terms of the readiness of the uh, concept itself, um, the companies that are working with uh, self-sovereign systems, such as, for example, Sovereign, and Evernim, they are saying that the uh, product currently is on the stage of proof of concept and definitely not a proof of value. However, it's clear that the prospects are very, very, very good. The regulators are currently making a lot of effort to regulate the use cases for self-sovereign identity verification. The European Commission, for example, has issued what is called the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework. And Spain and Germany declared that they will go into partnership in order to establish mutual uh, self-sovereign identity verification system in line with the uh, European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework. Some specific countries, for example, the United Kingdom, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, Canada, are working hard in order to establish the um, frameworks for the use of what is called the um, electronic identification documents. So this means that basically these documents will not be made in plastic or paper. This will be the electronic documents that you can store in the um, wallet that you can then in turn use for the purposes of self-sovereign verification. For example, the UK government is going to release the app that will be identifying the UK citizens with the biometrics and NFC for the purposes of self-sovereign identity verification systems. And the release of this application is scheduled for 2022. And the tender, the amount of tender is around $5.6 million. And also Canada is discussing potential partnership with the European Union in order to establish the common approach for the purposes of self-sovereign identity verification amidst the great push um, for the um, industry in Canada uh, and tenders that have been issued for the self-sovereign identity verification systems in such um, provinces as, for example, Ontario and British Columbia. And now France is also discussing the uh, possibility of introduction of electronic ID um, that would be working for the purposes of self-sovereign identification. But they're facing two main problems. One is that the uh, electronic ID as proposed include uh, English language. And uh, for some of the members of the parliament, this looks inappropriate. And they, they're saying either they should be other languages or just the French one. And the second problem is that uh, the current allowance uh, in terms of space uh, the, of the identity card uh, uh, pr proposes only 30 figures and some of the names in France uh, currently having more than 30 figures and so uh, they're not fitting the current uh, format of the EID card. Companies that are doing self-sovereign identity verification are not very numerous currently. Um, the main ones probably that we could uh, talk about is Evernim and uh, Sovereign. Sovereign is very famous for being the company that is building the blockchain for the purpose of self-sovereign identity verification. And they established actually a, a foundation called Sovereign Foundation that includes different working groups working on self-sovereign identity, including such problems as uh, Internet of Things and other issues related to self-sovereign identity. Evernim uh, is also a very important, very uh, prominent uh, firm doing this. They have several products already, such as, for example, Verify platform, which creates and stores uh, verifiable credentials, and Connect Me, which is a mobile app for the storage and, and use of uh, verifiable credentials for the purposes of uh, self-sovereign identity verification. It is quite notable that both companies are headquartered in Utah, in the United States, the state which is uh, very well known for the Church of the Later Day Saints, uh, or known also as uh, Mormon Church. Uh, the church which is known for being survived because of the self-reliance and self-sovereign activities 
And Mormons are very well known for uh, having the uh, principles of self-reliance and self-sovereignty as the main ones that really secured their presence. The company called Talao has already issued their wallet application that is available uh, in uh, Apple and Android for the purposes of uh, electronic identity verification, which is in conformity with the European Self-Sovereign Identity Verification Framework, and also EIDAS, the regulation on trust services and uh, e-signs that is issued previously by the European Union. EIDAS uh, is well known for being kind of like not very uh, workable solution, not very workable infrastructure in legal sense for the purposes of ident identity verification. However, it can actually be quite workable for the purposes of self-sovereign identity verification. And the only problem that will be standing there is that um, you have to be on a trusted list of any European country in order to work in accordance with the IDAS. But probably the, country, the companies that will be working uh, in the area of self-sovereign identity will not stop there and will be overcoming this restriction. All in all, what we can see is that on one side, um, the governments want to issue electronic ID documents. They want to be engaged in uh, self-sovereign identity systems. On the other hand, they still are not taking uh, steps for the purposes of, let's say, um, uh, allowing self-sovereign identity uh, in AML procedures. The people, the consumers, they are interested in having uh, as easy and as simple way of verification as possible, and they're not interested in sharing uh, identity documents in order, for example, to just verify the age of the person or the address of the person. The third thing is definitely that the blockchain will be gaining more and more trust and it will be used more and more in identity verification and in other different uh, procedures and in different uh, industry areas. Also, it's important to, to, make, uh, to make it clear that other procedures such as, for example, other, uh, let's say, industries such as, for example, open banking API and uh, in Internet of Things, they are compatible with the new approaches such as, for example, self solving and identity verification and so uh, the logic of the market is driving this approach um, to be used more and more and finally let's bear in mind that data is the oil of the new century and oil created monopolies because unlike data oil did not belong to anyone nowadays we see that uh, the information is uh, owned by large credit bureaus or um, social media networks or other large gigantic corporations that control loads of different different data. But we are seeing that uh, the scandals around data and the perceptions of the people are driving this market towards what is called the human-centered identity verification and human-centered um, data policy. And so in this situation, of course, the, the um, ways how to identify the person will also change. And self-sovereign identity systems are one of the good examples of how this can be organized. And we'll see where it goes. That's it.